yeah, so I usually run faster than Grace. Usually. Unless I'm like sick or, <laughs> or untrained, then uh, you know, she might just get a little edge on me there. But officially on the, on the New, York runners, uh, New York Road Runners, I'm always officially one corral ahead of yeah. Grace. So. But I think I still beat you the last two years in the New York City half, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> I'll beat you in your first marathon. <laughs> right. So what we thought would be um, probably helpful to do is I think most of you, well, some of you will know um, the history that Grace and I have had together as our careers have developed over the years. Uh, and some uh, figure that there's some kind of history there, but what, what really is it? So what we thought we'd do is use this, um, this opportunity, not just to describe our careers as our paths have crossed, like deviated and recrossed, uh, but more importantly is how that has really helped us to develop to, to reach in uh, essentially what is, you know, automated controls testing that I, I mentioned earlier and risk quantification. And then what we're going to do is go into a little bit more detail. So uh, I gave you the kind of skim the rock across the pond a little bit earlier today. Grace did a similar thing yesterday. So we're going to do a little bit of a deeper dive to, to get down to the, 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 the kind of how to do the automated controls testing and how to do the, uh, the, the quantification. So part of the story is um, uh, I'll, I'll only go back as far as, um, as EDS slash HP. So, uh, so I was uh, basically heading up the security risk and compliance function for the outsourcing business, which became Hewlett Packard Enterprise Services. Grace joined my leadership team um, to head up the compliance side of security risk and compliance. And as I mentioned earlier, it wasn't just for HP. HP was a client. We had nearly 4,000 clients around the globe in pretty much every industry, including military and government. And so we had that many control frameworks that we had to address as well as the related regulatory environments that we had to address for those industries or operations and the geo-specific regulatory obligations that we had to meet as well. So that was really the challenge that, that Grace um, took on. So perhaps Grace, if I at this point could kind of hand to you and just you know, tell, us, tell the story of yep, kind sure. of where you went and how you progressed with it. I'm gonna progress our, so, um, as Gavin said, we, we had a typical program like what we did uh, and, and sort of in metrics team has a similar um, module is uh, control testing. And so I had a, a fairly large team, I had about 150 staff globally, about 70 of those were engineers running a partnership with, um, a, a, with a strategic partner of ours that ran an infrastructure compliance tool. And we ran that on a number of our environments for our customers. And basically what we were doing is we were testing to make sure we did what we said we were gonna do. Um, we ran that against about a quarter of a million servers uh, every month. And then I had a team of folks that looked at that results and saw if we had any deviations from our controls and then they would go and work with the teams to get that mitigated or, or remediated. Then I had another team that um, was running my GRC platform and in that, we had the controls testing, like, like Metric Stream has in the, in the module, where we would do qu questions. And what we did is I built that out as a modulized program. We had um, modules that were for regulatory environments. So we had a PCI module, we had um, an ISO module, we had a GDPR module. We had modules that were based on our internal networks and frameworks, and, and so we had we had a virtual private cloud. So we had a testing that did for virtual private cloud. We also had a part, strategic partnerships with two of the big um, cloud providers, and so we had testing proactive testing that uh, tested for controls and an agreement and what we were supposed to be doing with our cloud providers, our relationship with our cloud providers, and then we also had technology. Um, we, we were, you know, we were HP, so we had mainframe still. So we had mainframe kind of testing as well. Uh, and then the, we had the base, we had a concept of, and most people do, a concept of key controls or baseline controls. So we had 50 of them. And we said, okay, so we need to make sure that no matter what our contract with our customers, these controls are in place. This is our baseline. This is our basement. This is how we ensure the ba basic um, privacy and, and security of our environment. And so we had key controls or baseline controls. And what we did is we ran these assessments on some periodic basis. So we had like a HIPAA. The HIPAA one ran um, for a third of our customers every single year. So then in a cycle of three years, we were getting every customer, every one of our, in, our customers. And we did it internally. 
And for our um, baselines, you know, as Gavin said, we had about three to 5,000 customers somewhere in there. We were sampling um, across our three areas, about 25 customers a, a year. And you can understand that is not, I mean, it would have taken me 10 years to get through all our customers. So, so this, is, this isn't efficient. And then the, the, what I would get is, I don't have time for this. I have this, pro, I have this, this report over here and I've got to go get that report and look at that report and tell you if I'm compliant or not. And then I've got to add that report into your, to your GRC platform. And I don't have time for this, this is audit fatigue. So I turned to two of the guys that worked for me and I said, you know, can we make these two tools talk to each other? We started with just two tools and we've, we expanded on it beyond that. But initially it was just our infrastructure compliance tool and my GSA platform. They were both looking at the same things, but they weren't talking to each other. Gavin likes to joke that, I know I, as Pat said, I have a background in, in social work. Um, and I've since got my MBA, but I, I worked in the field for many years without an engineering degree. So when I started this, I didn't know what an API was. I just knew computers were really smart and our engineers were really smart. And if they could make it talk to each other, they were gonna do that. And I understood the basics um, you know, concept of, a, of a, a common key. I said, well, we have a common key, we're looking at the same controls. So I said to you guys, can you make these things talk to each other and let's take the people out of it. So when we, I talked yesterday, I talked a little bit about um, our, the use of internal communication within our tool and then external within externally. Uh, so what we did is we took that and we made it talk to each other. And so rather than getting 25 customers per region, we were able to, to look at the results of all of those 250,000 servers that we were looking at on a monthly basis. And we were feeding that information into our GSC platform. And it meant that we could scale. The good news on scaling like that is that A, it reduced human error. So I had that swivel chair process where someone would look at that, we'd run the scans and they'd get the report and they'd ask, answer the question and say, yes, we're compliant and I'd say prove it and then they'd enter in data. Well, inevitably there's human error can be involved in that, right? So this way we had the, the computers talking to each other. This was great. The other thing it did was because we had such massive amounts of data, it allowed us to trend our compliance. When we can trend our compliance, what we could find is I could find common and systemic problems, and then I can talk to my delivery folks and say, we've got a common and systemic problem. Let's not resolve this on one-offs. Let's bring this all together and resolve this globally. So I want you to work with your teams and solve this globally. And in fact, in a couple of cases, we ended up having um, products that we ended up being then able to sell back to our customers because we found some problems that ended up being um, more revenue generating. And that wasn't my goal but we ended up finding a solution and one of them that ended up being revenue generating. The other thing that it did is it gave us the ability to look at the value of our controls. And we don't talk about that enough. So the value, we have all these controls and we know that we've got controls that we're not compliant with. We've got controls that um, we get exception, requests for exceptions for. We get controls that we're not compliant and we want to just do a risk acceptance. And so what we did is we looked at that data. We looked at our exceptions, especially our deviations, our um, at risk acceptances, and we said, what's the problem here? So when we had a common theme of non-compliance with the control, it tells us a couple of things. Is the control written adequately to the business need? Or, or we write it at gold standard and we will never be at gold standard and we don't have to be at gold standard. So we looked at those trends and we could take that and say, well, let's look at this. So did we write the control properly? Now, let's say it was a PCI control and it was written exactly the way it had to be. It was a requirement. We had to comply with it that way. Then that meant we had an education problem or we had a problem with resources. So it allowed us to take that information and use it intelligently to say, what's the base of this problem? And then we were able to put some value to it. Um, and then the other thing, like I said, is it, it gave us some near real-time compliance. So what it had, what the outcome of that is that when I looked at the value controls, it gave me three things. That we had some controls that were nice to have, that gold standard, that this would be great if we can comply with it, but maybe we can't. We had some controls that we should have. Um, you know, our customers wanted them. They, um, you know, in some cases, like let's say it was, it was a HIPAA, uh, security, some of them are addressable, some are, some are required, and so we were able to say, well, maybe we'd like to do that, and could we do that? And then we had the controls that we must have, and those are our regulatory, our customer contract requirements that said, we must do this. And that gave us the ability to look at that. So what did it look like? 
You saw this, this yesterday, and it was towards the end of my presentation. I said, I'll talk more about it tomorrow. And so if you look at this, the middle part of that, that's your GRC platform. And so you've got the breakdown of um, your asset management. Some of that may or may not be in your GRC platform. So some of these are feeds. On the left side, we've got things. And I have those arrows purposely bi-directional. Some of them are manual. Some of them are automated. They're not all automated. I have a version of this that I don't share on um, presentations because it's a little bit too crazy, where I have all these arrows going in, and, and there's a, um, arrows leading from like the, the security groups and into where they hat. But it, I found that it's just a little bit too confusing. Um, but you can talk to me afterwards. I'd be happy to share something like that and show you more uh, deeply how we had automation or, or manual efforts. Or sometimes it's just informed. So we've got our controls, I mean, our, our GRC platform, we've got our compliance management, our audit management issues, risks, vendor, business continuity. Um, we also had a, an area around threat and vulnerability that we had in there too. And we were able to take with automation, you see that bottom right corner, I think I have a pointer here. One of these is a pointer, this? I don't know. Let's see if I can do it, maybe not. Oh, maybe it's this one, this one here. So down in this corner here, which says external, <clears throat> we had, that's where we put our automation. And because we were able to bring that in directly into what we were working on, we were able to bring this into massive scale. And, and we had some great benefits with it. it. It helped us to be more compliant. It helped us to see the information faster, helped us see information on a larger scale. And then, like I said, we were able to work with folks to get it completed. I've since done that. I've since done it. So this was you know, back when we were at HP days. So we're here, you know, wind the clock forward seven years. Oh, we've got a bird in the room. <laughs> um, that was a little distracting. Um, we, maybe the bird wants to come join us. We, um, I've done it on a couple of things. So we, we built out beyond information, uh, infrastructure compliance when I was with HP and DXC. And we brought in um, some other things like uh, our um, static and dynamic code scanning. I'm now working on it. So bring it forward to now. I am working on this same concept right now with MetricStream. And we're in the process of developing that out with our um, vulnerability management tooling for uh, Guidewire. And what we're working on is bringing that in. I don't know if Doug's in the room, but I know he was here somewhere. Doug's in the back and he's building this for me. Um, uh, we are bringing it in. We're going to feed our issues and risk assessments through the information that we're getting from our vulnerability management tool. And I'm pretty excited because right now, we've got a manual process for risk assessments. I've got a vulnerability man management aggregation tool um, we've got a risk assessment and acceptance, and we have manual processes, and I'm getting the same complaint. Not surprisingly, is it's too much work. We can't do all this work. So we're, we're building it, and maybe next year or maybe in London next summer, we'll have it all built out, and we'll be able to talk about where we're successful with that with MetricStream. Hand it back over to you, Mr. Browns. Sure. <clears throat> That's how you know when your presentation is really good, when the birds fly in to listen to it. <laughs> And now I'm back here and the bird just flew out. <laughs> Point made. So, so there's a couple of things that I think are worth just kind of double clicking on a little bit with, with what uh, Grace was just sharing. And that is about the value of controls. And, you know, we say about like a critical control um, versus, you know, other, con other types of controls. And the critical control is basically when that control fails or if that control fails, then the consequences of that control failure are much more significant than another control that fails. So this was, um, was more than just saying, hey, let's look at the trends and see why is this particular control uh, potentially failing? But we were able to then answer the question like, so what? And so that, that's really what um, was kind of one of the themes, if you like, that I took from this model that we built out at HP. Um, and that became the the starter foundation, if you like, of the risk quantification that I'll share some more details with you now, um, which is that asset value-based risk quantification. Uh, now, by the way, so we call it grounds rules here. I just want to make sure we're clear that I didn't call it that. Somebody else called it that, and it was a play on the name because grounds, and so rather than ground rules, it's grounds rules. Now, I was at the Gartner, with Gartner last week. Gartner have, have published a number of papers on this and, and case studies. And Gartner th think that they called it grounds rules. <laughs> well, I was at the Gartner conference last week, so I was like, yeah, cool. MetricStream said, no, we called it grounds rules first. 
So don't tell Gartner, but Metric Stream called it ground rules. <laughs> So, um, so when you see that ground rules, it's it's not it's, it's not an arrogant thing. It's a, it's a, it's a tip of the hat to uh, to, to our metric stream colleagues. Um, so I just wanted to re-emphasize some of the things that we talked about a couple of hours ago about the fact that we can't do risk reduction when we think about risk as a consequence. Um, we 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 can change the consequence. We can do a consequence exchange. We can certainly reduce likelihood, but we can't eliminate. Um, risk or consequence. In the same way that in, in physics, we can't destroy energy, right? So, so energy, because it, it, every, every physical matter is, contains energy. If we burn a piece of wood, we convert it to a different kind of matter and we produce energy. So it's the same, essentially, scientific concept that we, just in the same way as we can't destroy energy, we can only exchange it or convert it. We can't we can't extinguish or we can't destroy consequence. We can exchange the consequences. So why that's relevant back to the, the example that Grace gave a few minutes ago around these controls and the control value. Um, you know where, where when you've got kids, you have the five whys. You know what I mean? Like the kid says, well, you know, you say, hey, kid, don't do that. And say, why? Well, because if you go too close to that, you're going to burn yourself. Why? Well, because fire is hot. Why? Because I said so until they get into the teens, and then that last one doesn't work. But this is like the five so what's. So we have this control failure. Let's say, let's use a specific example. Maybe it's a control related to password complexity. And let's say it's on, a, on an old uh, mainframe operating system. Well, it doesn't recognize uppercase and lowercase if it's that old. Right? So it's like, so this doesn't meet our password complexity control. So what? Well, then when internal audit come along, they're going to call us out on that. So what? And if that's the extent of the consequence, then that's going to be far less consequential than another control that says, we're going to fail to be compliant with a regulatory ob um, obligation that's going to result in impact to our business operations and or fines. So that's what the so what factor is. So when Grace was talking about the value of controls, I just want to make sure that we, we didn't miss the point there, that it's like not every control is created equal in terms of its value to the business or the consequences of the control's absence or the control being ineffective. So that's really what, um, like I say, became the foundation of um, ground rules, that <laughs> uh, there's this asset value-based risk quantification approach. So I'm going to spend a little bit more uh, time over the next kind of five or ten minutes or so just digging down into that in more detail to explain kind of how it works, because this is completely doable. So just back to, you know, why did I go asset value based versus some of the other models, like I said about like annualized loss, loss expectancy, we think we spent enough time on that this morning to really kind of make, the, or earlier today to make the point. Well, the other thing is, is models like that are kind of born out of different risk, um, risk domains. So for example, I joked earlier saying you can tell by my accent, I'm from Austin, Texas. Um, but in, in Austin, I, I live uh, downtown. So, in, so I'm in a condo. And so when I think about the, the kind of perils that could affect my, my unit, it's a finite number of perils. Fire, flood, theft, earthquake, although we don't get too many of those so far, unless they're doing extra fracking in North Texas, then maybe we do. Um, but the point being is you can count on almost one hand the number of perils that could impact my unit. So let's pick one of those perils, flood. So now let's think about scenarios. What are some of the scenarios that could flood my unit? Well, uh, for flood, it could be I leave a tap running, or somebody upstairs leaves a tap running, or one of the pipes burst in the riser, which did happen, by the way. Um, or there could be some bad construction. But again, I've got a finite number of scenarios. Now, by the way, I'm three blocks away from Ladybird Lake, and that has burst its banks multiple times in the last 100 years. But if that bursts its banks to the 23rd story, that's the, the new ice age. We've got much bigger problems than my unit being flooded out. So it's a finite number of scenarios. But in technology and cyber risk, we have an ever-increasing number of perils and we have an infinite number of scenarios. We cannot imagine the number of scenarios that we have. And so that's why trying to come up with a scenario and then quantify it, it's upside down. 
what we need for quantification to do for us is to tell us where our risks actually are, what we should care about. So when we say, so what? This model tells us the answer to the question, this is why we do or don't care, or why we care a little bit more or a little bit less. So on the, I talked earlier about this, this kind of uh, asset value risk score, and I kind of breezed through it quickly, but basically, like I said, it's like an air mile system. You know, you fly so many segments, you get points. If it's tied to your credit card, the more you spend, the more points you get. And it's not, therefore, it's not a relativity scale. Because if you do a relativity scale, zero through 10, then somebody has to govern what 10 really means. And somebody else, has, somebody has to govern what zero really means. Whereas when it's an empirical numeric score, then it is like risk as a currency. And that's the model we built this on, is like treat risk as its own currency. So let's say you've got something that is revenue generating. We don't just say, ah, oh, $5 million of revenue, therefore you get 5 million points. What this model does is says, what is the significance of that revenue? Because you might be running uh, an incubator business. Um, $5 million to you as an incubator business owner will mean everything. For your business, $5 million might be a rounding error or a fluctuation on the, on the, on the, in, uh, on the foreign exchange in a day. So we don't just say that, yeah, X dollars equals X point. We say, what is the significance of those dollars? What this model also then allows us to do is add points for strategic value. So this is completely knowable. Um, at Verizon, for example, same thing for any of the big carriers. If you were to look at the, um, you know, the, the, the 10K or the 10Q and you start to see the breakdown of where the revenue is coming from, there, there is more revenue today being generated from 4G and LTE networks than are being generated by 5G networks because that's where we are at this moment in time. But 5G is strategically important for the future revenue of any carrier. So the, the expectation of any carrier that's, that's investing in 5G is that wind the clock forward and 5G is gonna have revenue, in, in, uh, revenue streams that are more valuable than 4G and LTE. So just as an example, so if, if it's strategically important, then points are added because it's strategically important. Conversely, if that asset or that thing of value is on the track to be sunset, then its strategic value earns much less points than something that, that is being invested in. So what that allows us to do is literally create a numeric score for how valuable an asset is. And like I say, that asset is built up of a number of components of IT and potentially OT uh, type devices and, and technology and software. But what if it's not revenue generated? but it might be mission critical. And so we will assign points based on its mission criticality. So what would be an example of something that is mission critical, but not generating revenue? Well, I often think of two very simple examples. One would be a payroll system. It's mission critical because if we can't pay our people, we won't be operating for very long. Or it could be a payments collection platform, whether it's using credit cards, whether it's using wire transfers, that is critical to our business because that is what produces our cash flow. So it's not gener generating revenue, but it's mission critical. And so there's just a couple of simple examples that will earn, will award points because something is mission critical. Uh, and what that then allows us to do is, like I said, it allows us to stack rank with an empirical numeric score of how valuable an asset is today to our business and how, value we ex how valuable we expect it to be in the future. So what you might say, for example, is a provisioning platform will hit the top of the list, or something that is delivering services to a customer will hit the top of the list, whereas the system that is managing the, the, the cafeteria menu is at the bottom of the list. I mentioned lawyers twice today, I'm gonna to mention lawyers again. When I gave that example, one lawyer said, no, the menu system should be at the top but that's just lawyers. <laughs> so then we think about, well, what, what are the, uh, the architectural view? So I mentioned earlier a couple of examples. So let's say it's internet facing. Well, it's gonna get awarded points. Well, let's say if that platform is your company's .com landing page, unless it's somehow interconnected with other systems, well, of course, it's connected to the internet. So how do you differentiate between something that is connected to the internet 
that has relatively low consequence and something that is connected to the internet that has relatively high consequence? Well, again, that value score helps answer that question of what the potential consequence is, what that potential value is. But also what you'll notice here is we have coefficients. And what the coefficients represent is basically with all these characteristics that, we're, that are earning points, is how significant is that particular element or that particular characteristic in the context of that platform or that, that, that tool or that product. So for example, if it is your .com landing page that has got very low kind of you know, business impact potential, then you could set the coefficient for that platform of internet facing to also be a, a low co coefficient, a multiplier, essentially. Whereas your payments collection platform, you could say, well, it's internet facing, therefore we want to ramp the, the coefficient up for the fact it's internet facing because there's more significance if that system was to be breached or, or to become unavailable. So let's just give you a little flavor of, of, of kind of how these coefficients come together, which then allows us to give, put a business context driven score of how valuable and how exposed a given asset is. And I'll just spend a quick minute on the, what we call the actionable scores. Think about the actionable scores for the most part is you can correlate those to your controls. So when you're doing vulnerability scans, you find, you find uh, your vulnerabilities in open source, or you find vulnerabilities uh, in, you know, in, in other static code scans or, or DAST, or you find vulnerabilities within the infrastructure. All of those are correlatable to some kind of control. Or it could be that, hey, this system is not subscribed to a multi-factor authentication um, model, and it should be. So we would assign points because it's not subscribed when it should be. And so it's really the, the effectiveness of controls will in, will, we will add points based on how effective or ineffective any given control is in that platform. So what that allowed us to do, is, as I mentioned earlier, is that based on that, asset value score, we can say we'll have a, little, a lower tolerance for actionable points. So we might say, if you're at the top of the stack of that asset value score, we're only gonna let you play with 20 points of actionable. The lower down, we might say, well, you can have 50 points to play with. So we literally can, uh, can and do establish a risk-based budget. Not a dollar loss-based budget, but a risk as its own currency budget that then our um, pro, uh, you know, product owners and, and dev teams can actually operate in, a, in, a, in line with those, those, those established budgets. So I mentioned this earlier, you can only start from where you are. You can only start from the path that you're on. Um, the other thing I wanted to say, about, I, mean, I alluded to it earlier when I said about, you know, the goal that I had in the past was not to try and replace a GRC tools. So when we brought G, uh, metric stream in, it was to provide that harmonization, as I called it, the backplane. Um, because GRC is a whole litany of tools. Uh, and I think that's one of the values that we should be looking for from products like Metric that are provided by Metrostream is to give us that platform of harmonization. So, because by the way, you know, if we set the object to say, I want to get rid of every tool that is not Metricstream, let's say, and then we buy a company tomorrow, and guess what? We're getting the tools that they are using so that the ability to be able to integrate and harmonize also then allows us to, to continue to extend the, the efficacy of the whole program. Grace, any final oh, thoughts? Go back Sorry. to that slide. A um, couple of things I want to add. One is, uh, you said it in your presentation. I didn't say it yesterday, but I usually say it is that um, all that stuff that we were doing was all iterations. And, and I know you, you and I both like the Winston Churchill, uh, perfection is the enemy of progress. So start with something. Start with automating something. Do something. Don't wait until you have everything perfect. Because if you wait until you have everything perfect, you'll never make progress. So I think that's my takeaway for today is automate something. Start somewhere. And that's it from us, I believe. Pat. <laughs> Thank you all.